And one of the dangers is to have an inexperienced president taking over, believing that she can run the country when she cannot. The only issue in this election is Mr. Marcos himself and the 20 years of his misrule. Now look, I don't want to talk about this anymore. If you do, I'm going to walk out. I'm really lucky if I can get my face on television. In the Philippines, the campaign for president is over, and within hours, the voting begins. Good evening, I'm Ted Koppel, and this is Nightline. The contest has been raucous, bitter, and violent. In their final interviews before voters go to the polls, Philippine President Ferdinand Marcos and his challenger, Corazon Aquino. I deny categorically any speculations uh, uh, of uh, the uh, corruption and hidden wealth that is being alleged so much so. Since he controls almost everything in this country, it is really uh, unthinkable that we in the opposition, you know, can manage uh, cheating the way he is accusing us of. You will not be able to find any replacement of Subic and Clark, but you are free to get out any time you think it wise to do so. I respect uh, the military basis agreement, which will expire until 1991. And in the meantime, I will keep uh, all of my options open. Filipinos are not known to be good losers. Uh, they're always our great uh, losers. Uh, they never concede. But uh, in this particular matter, uh, Ted, I am so certain of victory. Mr. Marcos, as well as all of his uh, cronies, will get justice, uh, something which was denied my husband. This is a special edition of ABC News Nightline. Reporting from New York, Ted Koppel. What we have for you tonight is, we think, a fascinating broadcast. What we do not have is what we've been promising you for the last few days, a live confrontation between President Marcos and his challenger, Corazon Aquino. You should know the reasons why. President Marcos says that Philippine election law prohibits either candidate from campaigning on election day itself or during the 24 hours preceding election day. Everybody forgot that uh, the 6th is uh, not a campaign day. It is prohibited by the um, election code. And uh, therefore, when you set it for the 6th, we were about to violate the election code, including, and the punishment includes disqualification from public uh, office. And uh, I certainly uh, do not believe in violating uh, the law. If my opponent uh, and, uh, dares to take the risk, that, that's her business, that's her problem. But I, uh, I don't. I don't want to violate the law. No one has yet explained to us how an interview on American television, not rebroadcast in the Philippines, could violate any law. Furthermore, we offered to do the broadcast last night. Mrs. Aquino accepted. President Marcos did not. Nevertheless, both candidates agreed to separate interviews which were conducted earlier today. Because of the Philippine election law mentioned earlier, these are the final interviews of the Marcos and Aquino campaigns. As Nightline correspondent James Walker reports, the campaign, while short by American standards, has lacked nothing in intensity. <laughs> When Corazon Aquino registered to run for president of the Philippines, she seemed a bit overwhelmed. The mere fact that many people are considering me a woman, just a housewife. But there was no self-doubt on the part of her opponent, President Ferdinand Marcos. Let us keep our appointment with destiny. President Marcos does indeed have a sense of destiny. Three years ago, he authorized a project to create his own Mount Rushmore. Even his enemies consider him a brilliant politician. First elected president in 1965, he declared martial law in 1972, saying he needed to crack down on the growing communist and Muslim insurgency. This is the first presidential election since he lifted martial law in 1981. Marcos, Marcos. The Marcos political machine is legendary. Supporters bust to mass rallies with free entertainment. 
And after a dramatic entrance, a few campaign promises, Marco style. I now order, I hereby order, I hereby order the lowering of electric rates by the National Power Corporation. And he's also lowered interest rates, raised government salaries, and dispensed favors wherever he's gone. I saw you like that. Huh? And all of this faithfully reported by the primarily government-controlled media. But President Marcos, who has run this country for 20 years, is now facing his most serious political challenge. The self-effacing housewife, whom he refers to as my lady opponent, has run an astoundingly strong campaign. Aquino no longer looks overwhelmed. Without the help of a strong political machine, she has drawn enormous crowds, several hundred thousand last night in Manila. Her supporters wear yellow as a reminder of her murdered husband, Ninoy, who was considered Marcos's most powerful opponent. Ninoy Aquino was gunned down at the Manila airport two years ago as he returned from exile in the United States. I do not seek vengeance. I demand justice, not only for Ninoy, but for all the Filipinos who have been victimized by Marcos. Aquino accuses Marcos of repression, corruption, and destroying the economy. The economy of the Philippines is in bad shape. We have very, very wealthy people in this country. We have a tiny middle class, and 75% of the population uh, are living below the poverty line. Jaime Ongpen is a multi-million dollar businessman who supports Aquino over Marcos. He has literally disenfranchised hundreds of thousands of entrepreneurs and businessmen. Businessmen like Nathan Fahale, who say the Marcos policy of state-run monopolies is driving him off his coconut farm. Unfair? Would you call that fair when, you are the, when the buying price is uh, dictated and not based on the international market? I would call it very cheating already. The alienation of the business community is not Marcos's only problem. There have been reports in the American press questioning his war record and documenting extensive investments in the United States. But he ignores all that on the campaign trail, stressing instead the threat of communism and charging that Aquino would bring communists into the government. And you and I, who have no guns, you, the civilians, who are not soldiers, we will be the first to suffer. Many of us will die. He also accuses Aquino of waffling over issues such as the future of American bases here and not says she has no defense. political experience. A sheltered life is not a training ground for the raw and brutish situations that an organizational leader must grapple with. I concede that I cannot match Mr. Marcos when it comes to experience. I admit that I have no experience in cheating, stealing, lying, or assassinating political opponents. President Marcos can take tough rhetoric like that, and his machine is expected to deliver the votes this Friday. But he's 68 years old and in failing health and facing his toughest challenge in 20 years. Meanwhile, the Aquino campaign is running on emotion. She's become more than a politician. She's become a symbol for change. This is James Walker for Nightline in Manila. When we come back, a warning from Mrs. Aquino that there may be real trouble ahead if Marcos tries to steal the election. And President Marcos tells us what he'll do if he loses fair and square. Nightline, which tonight was honored with its third Alfred I. DuPont Columbia Journalism Award. Tonight's award, a special presentation of a gold baton the first of its kind in the 44-year history of the annual ceremony. The baton was presented for Nightline's week of broadcast from South Africa in March of 1985. The history of political skullduggery in the Philippines would make a Chicago ward healer blush. But one American analyst recently came to an unexpected conclusion. 
The greatest surprise, he says, is the apparent likelihood that Mr. Marcos can win without force or fraud. His opponent doesn't believe it, though. And in our interview, Mrs. Corazon Aquino issued an ominous warning. I just want to remind Mr. Marcos that it was he who called for snap elections. And uh, once the people decided to participate, uh, he better watch out uh, if he uh, threatens to frustrate their will again. Uh, I'm afraid he will have an angry people on his hands. Mrs. Aquino, you keep making uh, what sometimes sound like veiled threats and sometimes not so veiled. What do you mean, he'd better watch out? Well, uh, all along I have asked the people, you know, uh, not to engage in any violence. And uh, so far they have listened to me. And if you may recall, uh, just after my husband was assassinated, I did go on uh, radio in our country and I asked the people, you know, to observe uh, peaceful means and not to resort to violence, and they did obey me. But this time, uh, they have a greater stake in this. It's not just Corey Aquino, but the future of our children and our children's children. So uh, if they think that they have been cheated out of an election, I'm afraid they might not listen to me anymore if I still insist on going about this peacefully. Well, let me put it to you this way. You are running for president of the Philippines. You are putting yourself forward as the leader of your nation. And now, if I understand what you're telling me correctly, you're saying if the election doesn't go the right way, you may not be able to control even your own followers. That doesn't speak very well for your ability to be able to run the country. Well, uh, Ted, uh, the people who are with me now are so convinced that I will win. And if Marcos resorts to terrorism or to gross uh, cheating, then uh, the people who have supported me may finally think that the electoral process is just uh, not advisable anymore. Are you raising the specter, the possibility of something approaching even civil war? No, no, not, not civil war, as long as I can manage it. In fact, I have said that uh, if Mr. Marcos cheats me out of this election, then I will call for daily demonstrations. However, if these daily demonstrations will still not get us the desired results, then I am afraid that the people might not listen to me anymore. Mr. President, I don't remember any election in recent Filipino history, in fact, even in not so recent Filipino history, where the loser did not claim that there were technical and other reasons of foul. Oh, so, there has I, never... and, and perhaps, perhaps, you, perhaps you remember one, but I, I don't. I, um, I think you're right. <laughs> Filipinos are not known to be good losers. They're always our great uh, losers, and they never concede. But, uh, in this particular matter, uh, Ted, I am so certain of victory uh, that these uh, um, declarations of my opponent that there will be a civil war in this country indicate how desperate uh, they are. I uh, uh, certainly am uh, concerned about uh, the, uh, your attitude uh, that uh, you feel there would be cheating if I win, and there would be no cheating if she win. No, I think it's the other way around. I realize it is a hypothetical question, but in every election, someone has to win, someone has to lose, and I wonder if you would address the hypothetical question, though. If you lose, will you stand down? I have never thought of it, but uh, certainly if there is no question uh, which uh, nullifies the results of the election, as I said, I will perform my duty as uh, president in accordance with law. When we come back, President Marcos addresses two of the most controversial issues of this campaign, his war record and his health. Two issues in the Philippine election campaign recently made front page news, not just in the Philippines, but around the world. Both raised questions that only Ferdinand Marcos himself can fully answer. 
And there have been repeated reports in this country by correspondents who say that your bodyguards have had to support you, quite literally, sometimes almost carry you, that you have been taken backstage and that apparently you've been getting shots of some kind or another, or dialysis of some that kind or another. Is your, your, your health has, has been very much an issue, sir. I wonder if, you'd, if you would react Those to Those are fabricated. I have never been supported by my guard. I have a limp on the left knee where I was wounded in Bataan by Srapna. And occasionally when I'm tired, I do limp a little, but I don't need any support. And uh, I am proud of that uh, wound. I am proud that occasionally I must uh, limp. But certainly, being carried by my bodyguards is not part of it. I am carried by the crowd when I come into a rally. Uh, as a mark of triumph, it's a part of uh, the routine. And uh, those uh, foreign correspondents who report that I go in for a shot. Now, I, I wish they could come with me so that they can see that I have to change my underwear, my shirt, undershirt, uh, because I have caught a cold speaking in the rain. And uh, this uh, ir irritating repetition of uh, uh, these uh, legends and fables about my health is uh, certainly getting to be very boring. Mr. President, you mentioned a moment ago uh, having received a shrapnel wound at, at Bataan and that this old war wound sometimes comes back to trouble you. That, of course, raises another issue that has been very much here in the American press over the last couple of weeks, both in the New York Times and in the Washington Post. Both of them have done extensive articles which suggest that your claims and the claims of your supporters that you are so highly decorated are fabricated claims. I don't that see... In point of I don't think that that is the story. It's a story about my guerrilla group. It's not about the medals. Uh, even here, when the, a case of libel was filed, the publisher here did not question those medals. It's only you, Americans, who question it. I am not going to degrade myself by talking about those medals. If the American government wants them back, they can have them back. Uh, it's a good thing that we did not burn them. Uh, it's a good thing that we did not burn them at the uh, end of the war when you refused to give us our um, back salaries and refused to recognize all of us and we were not entitled to education uh, benefits, we were not entitled to medical benefits. But I was one of those who stopped our people from turning communist, especially the veterans because we did not fight for communism, we fought for freedom. Uh, now I wonder whether we also fought for the Americans and the American flag, to which we had sworn uh, when, too, when the MacArthur inducted us into the USAFE. I have no regrets, however, about having fought in Bataan. I have no regrets about fighting for, beside American soldiers. I have no regrets about uh, fighting under American officers. And probably if our country were ever to be um, attacked again, I would do the same thing. But I would certainly raise some questions about the conduct of the American government in relation to the veterans of the last war. I am certainly very disappointed. Mr. President, <clears throat> the question is not raised about the courage of Filipinos who fought against the Japanese during the Second World War. But the question, as you know, and you know this is not something I'm making up. You have seen those newspaper articles yourself, and you have seen some of the documents. Suggest that the guerrilla group that you claim to have led, in fact, either did not exist at all or was just a tiny group that played no major role. Then why is it recognized by the intelligence officer of General MacArthur in a uh, paper which is certified to by the uh, head of the archives of the United States? Now, look, I don't want to talk about this anymore. If you do, I'm going to walk out. When we come back, President Marcos plays his strongest card, and Mrs. Aquino responds. The issue? Political experience. It is certainly a major debating point for the Philippine president. He's got a lifetime of political experience. His opponent has almost none. President Marcos has been accused of running the issue into the ground, however, with consistent and disparaging remarks about Mrs. Aquino. 
Here's what the two candidates had to say about the question of Mrs. Aquino's political experience. First, President Marcos. You've had some rather disparaging remarks to make about Mrs. Aquino, not the least of them being that, uh, in effect, she has experience as a housewife, but little else. Do you think she has gained in stature over the last few weeks? And do you think it is possible that if she is elected, that she could serve effectively as president of the Philippines? I still believe that um, you need somebody who has been experienced to run our government in this time of crisis. I have nothing against her, but certainly when, the, say, your son is sick and uh, he needs an operation or he needs the expertise of a good doctor, you don't pick just anybody who has honesty and sincerity in order to cure your son. In that situation where she has no experience whatsoever, is uh, something uh, that uh, we have to uh, accept uh, and admit uh, realistically that uh, she had the, um, um, well, uh, the nerve to run without any experience whatsoever, uh, as she admitted, and it's not me who has said that, that she is inexperienced, it is her who said, what do I know about running a government? And uh, as an ordinary citizen, I would cry out immediately against uh, anybody who says that, uh, um, being uh, uh, given the presidency. But as president of the republic, I think it's my duty to um, uh, call attention to this uh, danger. I know that you, you made a great deal, and it is uh, an excellent rhetorical device, of saying, yes, you are inexperienced. You are inexperienced in corruption. You are inexperienced in crime. You are inexperienced in dictatorship. But let's be candid about it, you are also inexperienced in leadership. Now, there is a difference even between running a campaign as the widow of a martyred and beloved leader and running a country, a country that is, as you yourself have pointed out, in a great deal of trouble. To those who are neutral about you, what do you say about your lack of experience? Well, uh, more than experience, I think it is credibility that counts. And uh, the truth of the matter is that the Marcos government has lost all credibility and no way can Mr. Marcos possibly lead our country back uh, to recovery because uh, the Filipino peop people no longer believe in him. Uh, I realize that I am inexperienced, but as Mr. Marcos himself confessed, it took him six months to learn how to be president. And I guess uh, I can do the same thing. As we all know, there is no school for presidents. So uh, I don't think that should be uh, a point against me. Your own George Washington definitely had no experience either. It is possible that he had no experience as a president, but he certainly had some experience in leadership when he became president. Uh, and you are, you are trying to become now the leader of a fractured country, the leader of a country that has enormous economic problems, the leader of a country that is rife with corruption, as you yourself have said, the leader of a country that has so many problems that one wonders how even the most experienced leader would be able to take care of them. I don't mean to harp on it, but it is the central issue of the campaign against you. And what I would yes, like you to uh... focus on for a moment is not you simply as an alternative to President Marcos, but you on your own merits. I realize how uh, many people may think that I am not, you know, the perfect solution to everything, but let's just say I am the best uh, available solution to our problem. There are a great many people within your own coalition, within your own party right now, who see you as a useful device for getting rid of President Marcos, but who may have plans of their own for then shuttling you aside and having used you, then taking over power themselves. How would you prevent that from happening? Uh, nobody can use me, and I showed this very clearly when I insisted that I would be the presidential candidate. I mean, if people wanted me uh, to defeat Marcos, uh, they would have to do it my way. And you can ask the uh, politicians, the leading politicians in the opposition, how I was able to get all of them to agree 
that I would be the presidential candidate and not uh, anybody else. Otherwise, we would have had two candidates instead of just one. Again, Mrs. Aquino, the point I'm making is that I can see why they would be willing to stand aside for the immediate goal of getting President Marcos out of the way. But now we're talking about real power. Now we're talking about the power of governing and leading the Republic of the Philippines. And my question is, are you confident that you can continue to rule even when some of these people are going to be trying to take power away from you? Yes, I'm very confident of that because there were no deals involved when I ran for president. So nobody has a hold on me. I am my own person. I, and I intend to continue uh, being that kind of person. As, the, as I said, I don't owe anybody any favors. When we come back, how the two candidates intend to deal with an issue of crucial strategic importance to the United States, the future of U.S. bases in the Philippines. There have been American military bases in the Philippines since the turn of the century, established right after the Spanish-American War. Clark Field, once an outpost for horse cavalry, today the only permanent U.S. air base between Guam and Turkey. Subic Bay, a naval station since 1901, now the largest U.S. naval supply depot outside the United States, and particularly critical to the United States since the loss of Cameron Bay in Vietnam. The loss of those Philippine bases, experts say, might only be replaced by the building of a naval battle group that would take years and cost perhaps $50 billion. Let's talk for a moment about the kind of relationship that a government of, of the Philippines under Corino uh, Aquino would have with the United States. What kind of a relationship would you want to have with the United States? Well, uh, I would like to continue our friendly relations with the United States, and I see no reason why that cannot be so. In fact, I would like to strengthen those uh, relations, and uh, definitely uh, we will be in uh, direct dialogue with, the, with your government. So I really see no problems there. Well, uh, the, the problems again, and it seems to me that there has been a little bit of waffling on the issue of the bases over the course of the, of the last couple of months. Would you tell me now in these final hours of the campaign precisely what your position on the, on the bases at Subic Bay uh, and Clark. Clark Air Force Base are? What is your position now? All right. Uh, I respect uh, the military bases agreement, which will expire until 1991. And in the meantime, I will keep uh, all of my options open. I know that uh, no sovereign state can ever allow any part of its territory to be in the perpetual possession of a foreign power. And I think no ally of ours will be demanding this of me. I am not hearing from you the kind of reassurance that I think Washington really wants to hear. Now, obviously, you're under, you're under no compulsion to give it, but I wonder whether that is deliberate. No, it's not deliberate. Uh, before the uh, RP-US uh, basis agreement expires in 1991, we will be in consultation with the United States, with our neighboring countries, especially the members of ASEAN, and above all, we will be consulting with the Filipino people so that we will be able to reach an agreement which will be to the best interest of uh, the world, but in particular, uh, the Philippines. I've always maintained that those bases are needed by the two governments and probably by uh, Asia itself, if not the world. Uh, you cannot project your naval and air power uh, beyond the South China Sea as well as uh, to the Indian Ocean and the Hormuz Straits uh, um, in the Middle East uh, without those bases. And uh, we also recognize that uh, Asian countries may be in danger if the balance of military power were not maintained between the two superpowers. And therefore, the ultimate uh, noble purpose of all of this is to maintain that military balance 
in order that we can avoid war in Asia. This is uh, uh, to the advantage of uh, not only the United States and the Philippines, but uh, to the advantage of all of Asia and perhaps uh, of the Middle East, Europe, and perhaps the world. When you hear people speculating in this country, and there has been some considerable speculation, that perhaps things are becoming a little bit too dicey in the Philippines <coughs> and that the United States ought to think about putting its bases elsewhere. <coughs> you, take that, you take that seriously? I take it seriously, and um, uh, certainly um, we would not stop you if you want to get out of the Philippines. Do you think that Subic and Clark can be replaced? You will not be able to find any replacement of Subic and Clark, but you are free to get out any time you think it wise to do so. When we come back, both candidates respond to the charge that fraud and corruption have become a way of life in Philippine politics. In a moment, we'll hear Mrs. Aquino respond to the charge of election fraud on the part of her followers. But first, some more detailed charges that have been leveled against President Marcos. Mr. President, some would say that the gravest danger to the Philippines this day, uh, these days is that there is a crisis of confidence. And that what Mrs. Aquino would bring to the presidency would be a fresh breeze and that she could get the expertise by surrounding herself with competent experts, but that what is needed is a, a fresh sense of trust, a sense that the corruption that is charged will be cleaned out, a sense that the cronyism that is charged will be cleaned out, a sense that the brutality that is charged against members of your armed forces and the police will be cleaned out, and that Mrs. Aquino can fulfill that role and you cannot. Uh, you, sir, are guilty of um, speculation and making allegations that are not proved by evidence. Corruption and uh, hidden wealth were charges included in the impeachment proceeding. They were debated upon, and uh, the opposition was challenged to present their evidence. They could not. There is no evidence. Even in your hearings in the House of Representatives subcommittee of um, Mr. Sola, um, Congressman Solomon and Roth, uh, I think, have said that there is no evidence about uh, corruption or hidden wealth, and that this is all hearsay and all rumor. Now you repeat it as if it is the gospel truth. I question your right to um, make this as a premise for any further uh, questioning. I uh, must say that uh, hearsay, rumors, speculation as a basis for a question by uh, reputable uh, uh, newspapers and foreign correspondents uh, should have no place uh, in the, a uh, society like ours. Your society Mr. and President, ours. President, you are, you are quite right. If I were the only one raising those questions, there would be no point the in raising them at all. The number does not it matter, Ted. Whether a thousand people raise it, if there is no evidence, then it is false. Whether it is raised by 10,000 people, if there is no evidence, then it is uh, patently false. Numbers do not matter. It is evidence that matters. And you don't have any evidence. Mr. Solars has no evidence. The opposition has no evidence. They're just talking loud, and they're engaged in the a smear campaign, and you are helping them. Mr. Solars claims that he has testimony from someone who met with Mrs. Who, who claims that he has testimony from someone who met with your wife, Mrs. Marcos, who spoke to him of properties that you hold through other that, names in New York, and that Mrs. Marcos said to this man who testified before the committee that she expected by 1987 to have seventy million dollars worth in profits on those properties. Now that is the testimony. You're saying there is no testimony. It may be inaccurate, but the testimony, sir, is there. The uh, witness, when asked by uh, Congressman Solomon whether there is any evidence whatsoever proving this, said, I merely heard it. It is uh, something that I heard from somebody. I uh, do not know your sources of information. You may be more accurate than I am. 
but uh, certainly I don't consider that uh, evidence uh, which uh, ties us up to the ownership of uh, any of these uh, properties. Um, and uh, we are looking into the manner in which uh, the evidence has been obtained by uh, uh, some of your investigators and some of your foreign correspondents, your newspaper men. And then uh, after the elections, we will then uh, look into the legal aspects of the coercion and intimidation that has been going on against some of the witnesses. But anyway, whatever it is, I deny categorically any speculations uh, uh, of uh, the uh, corruption and hidden wealth that is being alleged, so much so that uh, the opposition members of the Batasan, the legislature, are now uh, facing perjury cases in our courts. And we are going to see to it that these cases will be pushed uh, through. There have been charges by both sides against both sides of corruption in the voting process. How is it going to be possible for anyone ever to be satisfied that this was an honest election, even if it were? Well, I guess uh, as long as it is fairly honest, then uh, we would be able to satisfy uh, everybody. But if there are outright violations and we can see that there has been such enormous fraud, then that would be difficult to convince the Filipino people. But as I said earlier, um, since there are so many people personally involved in these elections, then uh, we will see people power uh, working to make sure that we get as clean and honest elections as possible. How much fraud, how much corruption in the process are you prepared to accept? Well, that all depends, Ted. Uh, naturally, I cannot envision uh, what Mr. Marcos is going to do. So uh, I cannot say right now just uh, what it is that I will be able to accept or what I will totally reject. There is an enormous difficulty in ever reaching a decision on how much fraud there has been. Both sides are going to claim it. We know that already. Your side is going to claim it. His side is going to claim it. How is it ever going to be possible to reach an understanding on what happened and how much fraud there was? Well, Ted, uh, we all know who is the real power in this country, and it's a one-man power. So uh, since he controls almost everything in this country, it is really uh, unthinkable that we in the opposition, you know, can manage uh, cheating the way he is accusing us of. He controls Comelec, and uh, he has all of the government forces behind him. So how can he possibly accuse us of committing uh, fraud? Well, if he has all the power, as you say, and if you already believe that he is committed to win this election by whatever means he can, then how is it possible that you're going to win? Well, as I've uh, been saying all along, it's people power that has finally emerged uh, in this past campaign. And uh, there will be many of these people uh, uh, who will be poll watchers in the coming elections. So they will be guarding the their respective uh, pre polling precincts and they will also be uh, watching the uh, tabulations. So I am counting on all of these people uh, to help us get an accurate count. What happened during the campaign with regard to media coverage? President Marcos has told me that you have certainly had access to the television and radio stations and he denies categorically that you have been kept off? Well, uh, you know, take for example uh, the question of rallies and uh, hours last night, um, I don't know if you were given a minute or two, but normally uh, all of President Marcos's speeches are covered in full. So I'll be lucky if I can have a sentence or two. We both addressed the uh, Chamber of Industries and his speech was uh, covered in full. I think I had two sentences uh, which I was allowed to, well, which local television aired. Maybe I can refer back to my husband's own uh, funeral where 
the Filipino people saw, n saw nothing of my husband's funeral, but which was viewed throughout the world. So things haven't changed much uh, since that time. And I'm really lucky if I can get my face on television. What they are doing to me now is that they uh, use uh, some of my uh, video shots and they impose it on their commercial, excuse me, on their commercials. And then they have somebody pretending to be me and, you know, uh, talking as if it were Cory Aquino. And there's nothing I can do about it because all of... Uh, media is, uh, well, all of television is under the control of Mr. Marcos. When we come back, some final observations on the debate that never was. The live debate, of course, never happened. During the course of my interview with President Marcos today, I asked if he would still consider talking directly to Mrs. Aquino on Nightline if we were able to arrange it before the legal deadline that prohibits further campaigning. It must be noted that the president said he would. It must also be noted that he set certain conditions. He and Mrs. Aquino would have to be at the same location. I would have to be joined by at least two Filipino journalists who would also pose questions. They would have to be acceptable to both candidates. And all of this would have had to be arranged within eight hours. That is, before the campaign legally expired at 11 o'clock this morning, our time. We tried, but Mrs. Aquino was making a final campaign swing through her home province of Tarlac, several hours from Manila. It was there, in fact, that I interviewed her. That's why she was on the phone. We wish there could have been a debate here. Even more, we wish there could have been a debate there before the voters of the Philippines. Somehow, despite the fact that President Marcos and Mrs. Aquino claimed to want that, it never came to pass. Tomorrow on World News Tonight, the latest on the Philippine elections with Peter Jennings anchoring the broadcast live from Manila. That's our report for tonight. I'm Ted Koppel in New York. For all of us here at ABC News, good night.